Hello and good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, a special edition of This Week with the uh, Communist Party. Happy uh, day before uh, Labor Day and uh, good evening, Revolution. We always uh, <laughs> say that. Good morning, Revolution, taking uh, Langston Hughes's wonderful poem. Uh, tonight, we uh, have some uh, special guests. I want to start off by uh, introducing uh, uh, Lisa Bergman. Uh, hi, hi, Lisa. Hi, everybody. How are you? Lisa, I'm good. I'm great. Lisa's a <laughs> chairperson of the Connecticut State Committee of the Communist Party. And then moving from my right to my left, and that's not a political statement at all, <laughs> Chauncey uh, uh, Robinson. Chauncey, hi Chauncey. Hi everyone, hi. how's it going? Chauncey's coming to us from the great city of Los Angeles uh, this evening. Chauncey is the uh, social media and cultural editor at peoplesworld.org. Uh, uh, welcome, Chauncey, and thanks for being with us this evening. And uh, Jarvis Tyner, where'd you go, brother? Here I am. Uh, Jarvis, hey, Jarvis, welcome. Come on, Joe. Glad Jarvis, to be here. Uh, the old friend of uh, mine, and uh, Jarvis is a member of the National Committee of the Party and the chairman of the uh, New York organization. And last but not least uh, is Scott. Hey, Scott. Hey. Uh, I think we've had a, another uh, another guest join us, um, uh, Michael uh, David. Who, uh, Jody? You want to do the introductions? <laughs> Michael Lynch, how are you? Coming. Michael is from the Buckeye State. Well, uh, and he's a student, uh, graduate student, worker, professor, exploited uh, at the Ohio University. Hey, Michael, how are you? I'm good. Everything's good here. We have some thunderstorms, but I'm not going to let that bring me down. We're celebrating 100 years. <laughs> good, good. Michael is a leader of our communist youth and the uh, uh, newly organizing Young Communist League, which we're very excited about. So, so uh, one of the organizers and, and um, creators and editors of the Spectre uh, podcast. Exactly, and we urge exactly. you to go to our website, which is a youth-run, operated, independent um, uh, podcast that is on our website, and there are a number of editions of it, so please uh, go to cpusa.org and check it out. Well, we're celebrating our 100th birthday today, 100 years ago today on September the 1st. The uh, party was uh, founded. Um, and we're still here and we're still alive and kicking. So Jarvis, if there was one thing in the history of the party that stands out for you that you'd like to share with us this evening, what would that be? Well, there was so much, you know, I've been doing this thing for over uh, 50 years, actually closer to 60. And um, there were so many great things. But let me just tell you, I came in in 61. I was actually had no left wing background. My parents weren't communists. I had to literally learn it. I was a worker in a shop and a member of the trade union. Well, not at first I was not a member, but I organized my shop because I was a member of the Communist Party. And uh, so many things happened that I think helped to uh, cement my commitment and uh, really love for this party. First, I learned about its history and the great contribution of the industrial workers and all that. But I, I don't want to make a long thing here. I want to just tell you one little story that may seem rather minor, but to us it was so important because it taught us how uh, a organized uh, political party with our perspective can change the world. And, and I first I remember uh, we were fighting for uh, a multiracial uh, presence in the, in the peace movement. And there was not a lot of that. We were fighting for respect for working people and that the left uh, is, is really isolated if it didn't have working people organized and part of it and that the party's tradition did that. But one thing that happened, we have formed a civil rights organization in my community in, in uh, Philadelphia. 
we were a youth group and we were part of a socialist youth union as a broad group, but we were all members, not all of us, but I wasn't at first a member of the party, but then I became one. And we decided that American Bandstand, which was in our West Philadelphia community, but was uh, completely uh, white. There were no black kids who went on there. Uh, there was another show on PBS, which you could hardly get with the Rabbit Ears, that was a black dancing show even though they both danced to the same music pretty much. And, um, you know, pretty much the same way they danced, same style. So we decided we were gonna integrate um, American Bandstand. So we picked a, a group of four couples um, and made sure they were visibly African-American and that, and uh, because uh, we wanted to make the, the public see that's what happened. So they got in line waiting for bandstand to open. And that's what you had to do. I literally, I lived like six blocks from where they filmed bandstand. Mm -hmm. but there were no black kids on it. We were, it was in the middle of the black community at the Philadelphia arena, near the Philadelphia arena. So we, uh, we sent these four um, teams down, four couples down. They got in line and we separated them on the line so that if one got knocked off, they would have another one and another one and another one. And, uh, so they, this guy, this manager or director or whatever bandstand was letting people in. And when he got to the first black couple, he said, wait a minute, just sit there. Don't go anywhere. Just wait a minute. And they said, okay, it's coming. They're going to tell us to get lost. We're never going to get on this show. Out walks Dick Clark. And Dick Clark said, welcome. Hmm which means that he wanted to see this thing integrated. I mean, every major black R&B star was on that show all the time. They had a huge audience, multiracial. And you know, uh, then in the future, when they got to, Cal uh, to LA, it was totally integrated, but it was the Communist Party of Eastern Pennsylvania that broke the ice, that did it. Well, that's if they didn't challenge it, it would have never maybe happened. That's a wonderful story. So first in baseball. Uh, right, with Jackie, Jackie Robinson. You know? That's right. That's a, that's a great story. Uh, Chauncey, one thing that in the history of the party that you would highlight, what would it be? Um, I guess, I mean, well, one of the solid, the history of it being connected to so many other like international movements, but I, I guess, I mean, it's not too far to me degrees of separation from me is that the party along with other allies and and uh, workers and others helped to found the daily worker which is the publication that connected to some you know almost 98 years that i'm able to have the pleasure of working on and was one of the organizations to really push for press that was uh, for working people and make such a huge impact, especially in this time of uh, fake news and things that have a Marxist Leninist type of perspective uh, in a publication is, is, you know, you have other socialist publication, things like that, but to know that the party, um, you know, is connected to, to a publication that it has such a uh, wide reach in terms of the people who have written for it, the people that have the things we've covered, the things that have been covered in the past, the way that was looked to, and just being the first in many cases, such as like the Reese Taylor uh, case, where it was a young African-American woman who was raped uh, during in the, in the South, and there was no justice for her. And the uh, Daily Worker was one of, was the only publication outside of the Black press to cover that um to cover that story to interview her to let her tell her story to get that out when so many were trying to ignore it and that's just something that's always stood out to me that you know just as Jarvis was talking about the party being so connected to being the first and not always getting the credit for it a lot of the time in mainstream uh you know culture but when you dig in just a little deep you find that we were there and we've like always been there which is really just exciting to me so I think that's a really important uh, point. And when we were talking about baseball, we were talking about the fight to integrate baseball with Jackie Robinson. And there was a reporter for the uh, party that uh, played a big role. What was his name? Lester, Lester, right. Rodney, Lester Rodney, I think. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to go look up that history, you know, you would be uh, 
it would be a, you 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 would be well served. Uh, Michael, looking at you this evening, uh, in your opinion, pick one thing out of the history of the party, the last one hundred years, that you would highlight. What would it be? Well, you know, it's always, it's not annoyed me that people tend to look back and say, you know, the 1930s, the red decade, you know, that's the greatest, you know, the popular front. But I think even more recently and more significant was the fight to free Angela Davis because mm -hmm. it was taking place at a time, it was shortly after the height of the civil rights movement when we had, you know, the Civil Rights Act uh, signed by Lyndon B. Johnson. And People see that and then the death of Martin Luther King in 1968 as kind of like the end of the civil rights uh, movement. But given the, the protests against the Vietnam War and Angela Davis getting fired in 1969 from UCLA for first not cutting off her afro and then second being a member of the Communist Party and the death threats she got on top of, you know, her expulsion from the university and then being arrested you know, under the false accusation of, you know, arming uh, young black militants to kidnap a judge and, uh, you know, kill ju a judge and jurist, you know, and the fact that our party was brought to the front, you know, of that as, you know, she's, she was on the FBI most wanted list, et cetera, et cetera. And this was again at the time of right after the civil rights era, but, you know, during the Vietnam war. And so the fact that our party was brought into light during that, but it was much more of a struggle you know, than just freeing a communist, a member of our party, but it turned into a broad, a uh, wide movement, not just nationally, but internationally, you know, across college campuses, um, across borders. I remember seeing a video of Angela Davis's sister, Fania Davis in Paris, uh, speaking to a large audience of mostly not communists. You know, there were members of the French Communist Party there and they were enchanting in French, you know, freedom for Angela, freedom for Angela. And so just to know that, you know, across the world people were fighting for you know the political freedom of angela davis a member of the communist party of the united states it's quite significant and the leadership role that our party played in that now before we go further i want to invite everybody who's watching this show to click on the link on your facebook page and start a watch party share this event with your friends so that people can see it you know spread spread the socialist wealth you know by the way, Michael, Angela Davis was just inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. And so we want to offer her our congratulations. It's a big, big blow against racism and anti-socialism and anti-communism and for women's rights. So congratulations to our sister and comrade Angela Davis. Lisa, your turn. One thing you want to highlight that stands out in the history of the party uh, for you? Well, um, I recently watched um, the the Netflix series When They See Us for the first time, and I, I know a lot of people watched it when it first came out, but um, we recently showed it at our um, community center in New Haven, at the New Haven People Center, and the Young Communist League um, led a discussion around that that series. Um, so more people are becoming familiar with the Central Park Five case and what happened with that. Um, but one of my favorite stories with the party is about the Scottsboro Nine case, um, where nine um, African American teenagers were, were accused in Alabama, I believe in 1931, of raping uh, two white women, which they did not do. And the Communist Party was really the only organization that kept on their case um, until they were exonerated and they were, you know, in that environment, that time, it was an even uh, high, bigger lift, if one could imagine, than, than the Central Park Five case was in some ways. But um, that's one of my favorite stories of the party has been on the forefront of um, taking on racism through this whole time, time period since we were started. And uh, it's it's been in some of the most uh, most challenging moments in history that that we've done that so i wanted to i was going to talk about the scottsboro nine as well uh but um oh, i took your scott uh yeah uh, lisa got there first and and uh did it uh more eloquently than i could probably um but uh just adding to it that um the what the party brought to that struggle was um not just the understanding that that uh, 
racism was a, a social evil that had to be combated, but also that um, that white workers had an interest in fighting it. So the party was organizing uh, both black and white working class people um, and um, uh, African Americans uh, as a whole uh, around that uh, around that fight. Um, so uh, right, that, that idea of the, the unity of um, black and white uh, workers in, in pursuit of a, a better world was really kind of became in a certain sense the hallmark I think of, of, of our party's history. That's a great point, Scott. And my choice is the fight to integrate swimming pools in the early 1950s. People think that the civil rights movement started in the 60s. Not true. It was went on in the 40s and it went on in the early 50s. And the reason that that, that is important to me is that's where my mom met my dad. They were fighting to integrate the swimming pool on the south side of Youngstown and they had to fight their way in and they fought their way out. And even though my mother hated boxing, she thought my dad, who was a former boxer, had a great left hook. So that's kind of <laughs> true story, by the way. So um, comrades, uh, let's look forward a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, we talked a little bit about the history of the body, what stands out for you. Um, Going forward, what do you think are the most important struggles that the party has to be involved in in order to um, not only make a name for itself, but make a contribution to the equality uh, and uh, freedom for um, people of color and all working people? What's the major, uh, what, what issue do you think stands out? Um, Jarvis? Well, you know, uh, the party has never had a problem with fighting for democracy and harmonizing that with the socialist mission because the fight for democracy was the way towards social. Marx said that. And uh, we understood that. That's what Scott Sparrow and all that. I mean, besides the great principles involved in fighting racism, it was also a strategic question if you can't defeat racism, you couldn't, you couldn't bring about uh, a change and ultimately socialism. So uh, to me, I think, I think the, the party understanding that put it in the middle of a lot of struggles um, that some on the left might consider, oh, they're reformers and so forth. Um, but we didn't see reform or revolution. We saw reform, reform and revolution, they were with the dialectical relationship was going on there. And I love that about the party because I could go home and talk to my parents who were sharecroppers kids from North Carolina about what we were doing and they understood it. I told my aunt once that I was going to the Soviet Union uh, for a youth conference. And she said, you think you could take me along? <laughs> she was a garment worker in Philadelphia. And that's how, that, when I saw this kind of connection that was going on, with our family and my friends, uh, all of whom wanted uh, to support me. They were a little scared of some of the stuff I was you know, associated with, but they wanted to support me. And they told me later that, man, I wish we could have been able to step out and, and be a part of that thing. That, that contribution was tremendous. And the second thing, and I'll end, is we can never underestimate the fact that the communist were attacked by the government really for a hundred years, but in the fifties outlawed completely, but fought and, and went to prison. And therefore, if they hadn't fought and stood up to this thing, the possibility of dissent and the right of the left, and even now they're trying to revive it, but everybody said, oh, it's McCarthyism. Well, why are they afraid of McCarthyism? Because the communists stood up. That's it, Paul Robeson, stood up, William L. Patterson stood up, Du Bois uh, uh, stood up, William Z. Foster stood up, Gus Hall, Henry Winston, they stood up, Claudia Jones, they stood up, Elizabeth Gurley Friend, they stood up, and that made it possible for us to go forward. Really, really important point. Uh, and there was a movement at that, t in, in the, at the end of the McCarthy period, so I think it was called like the Free 
speech movement on right. the college campuses. That's right. That uh, Herbert Abfecker mm -hmm. and uh, Gus Hall uh, participated in. Uh, ben Davis. Ben Davis, and, uh, and, and that kind of broke the Cold War uh, ice. Lisa, in your opinion, what um, is the struggle or the struggles, plural, that are going to move us forward uh, in the in the next edition, in the next chapter? We had our convention. Now what? Well, I think our main uh, struggle and focus that will really help us move forward is developing uh, the next generation of leadership. And we have such a proud, beautiful history to build on and learn from um, and strong principles to guide us, but we have so many wonderful uh, next generation people that are coming forward and really learning about um, what socialism and communism really mean. Um, and uh, that actually is dear to their heart too, that everybody should have a decent job, that everybody should have a good place to go to school and not end up in $100,000 of debt when you're like, haven't even started off in life. Um, these are things that many, many people believe. Um, but I think one of our main struggles and focuses right now can be to train um, young people to articulate these things and that that is what socialism is. It's not a foreign concept. It didn't come from a different country. It's not a dictatorship. It means democracy, like Jarvis is saying. It means everybody having a voice and the working people really being in charge of the wealth of this country, which um, would make things just better for everybody. Um, anyway, if, if we can focus on one thing, I would say developing our next generation of leadership and the urgent crisis right now of um, ending Trumpism, ending the extreme right wing, the fascism that's happening in our country, um, which is basically a replay of Hitler's tactics. Uh, with the Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, Lisa. That's right. No, it's uh, in, in a direction, though. Um, yeah. So we, we've been talking about, you know, the Scottsboro Nine and uh, the part the history of, of the struggle against white supremacy. Um, how does that connect to the, the, the fight for the rights of, of immigrants and refugees uh, today? What um, what what's our perspective on that? And um, is, is that is that an issue that can become one of these? Uh, defining issues um, for the for the party. Um, Are you going to answer that? I'm <laughs> not going to answer. I'm looking for the answer. That's the. Oh, that's okay. The... Go ahead, Jonty. Oh, all right. Uh, <laughs> well, I was going to talk about something. Well, I mean, the the whole question of uh, immigration and refugees and and things like that. It's 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 seeing that it's part of a bigger struggle. And I think that's one of the things I guess I'll just connect it to what the answer I was going to give is that understanding that all of these fights that we have are connected to the bigger struggle for liberation, the bigger struggle for democracy for all people. And that's a that's an international viewpoint. That's not just, you know, one uh, section of workers or another section of workers, but understanding that, you know, it's kind of like our age old um Age old, but our um, longer slogan of, you know, if one is in chains, we're all in chains and understanding that what we're fighting for when we fight for the rights of immigrants, we fight to get children and people in general out of cages and, and things of that nature is understanding that if these people are oppressed, then we all are oppressed because this is a tactic. It's understanding that those who are in power when it comes to controlling, you know, that 1% that controls like all of the wealth that, you know, these things of sexism, racism, xenophobia, and all of that is a, is a game book, you know, it's a playbook that they have to keep all of us as working people divided. Um, I was actually going to mention in the immediate sense, and, you know, Lisa kind of touched upon it uh, a bit with the Trumpism, is the immediate thing in understanding the bigger struggle of defeating Trump in 2020 is understanding the tactics that they used to go after our rights. You know, one of the things I always think about is that I think communists are the most, you know, uh, patriotic people in the sense of being for democracy, like true democracy in that sense. And one of the ways we fight against that is the immediate uh, ever, the immediate problem that we've had since, uh, well, it's been going on for years, but they ramped it up, you know, after Obama's election, which was voter suppression. That is a very serious issue that we, you know, they target 
black and brown voters. They target working class people. They target the right wing. They target people that they know will vote, will not vote for Trump. They want to make sure they don't get to the polls. They, they want to make sure that they aren't able to vote to exercise their rights. And we saw, we saw that back during, you know, the failure of radical reconstruction where they had the black code and all the other things to get people not to vote. And, you know, we're seeing a repeat of history now. And I think it's important, you know, our role, you know, as in the, with the party is to be able to, to sift through the sensationalism of, you know, the latest tweet that Trump has had or the latest, you know, thing that mainstream, uh, mainstream media and others are trying to focus on to say there's some real serious issues they're trying to do a sleight of the hand to not have us focus on. And one of those main issues is voter suppression. And if we're going to have a chance to defeat Trumpism, to have a, to not be on the defensive of the rights we've already fought for as working people, then we have to address that, that immediate problem as well. So um, to me, that's an immediate thing. And of course, you know, as Scott was talking about the of connecting to all workers when it comes to the immediate things they're fighting for as well as that that connects to all of our struggles. So we need a broad front to defeat Trump, a broad united front that's multi-class and uh, composed of as many people as we can get into it. And at the same time, one of the cutting edge issues is voter suppression. And on the front line of that fight is the state of Florida, where you know they passed a law that would give prisoners, uh, most yes. of whom are African-American and Latino, uh, the right to vote. And then they went and said that in order for them to vote, they had to pay a poll tax in essence, you know? They had to pay a thousand dollars or something. Or per and we've seen the poll tax before. Yes. You, know, re you know, history repeats itself. They don't have anything new. They just keep pushing the same stuff, <laughs> just in new forms a lot of the time. So now one of my friends and uh, brother Seth uh, down in uh, Philly had an idea and he, he, he thought that we ought to try to uh, do a GoFundMe campaign, a national GoFundMe campaign that would uh, raise the money to pay off the debt of all of the ex-prisoners, you know? So that's an interesting idea. I talked to some people in Florida about it and they said, well, maybe, you know, but there's a suit now in Florida to dismiss the whole thing. So we'll have to see, you know, uh, uh, where that goes. Do any of you have any favorite candidates? I mean, you know, we're in a socialist moment. And we're welcoming the, the uh, candidacy of uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, who, who seems to be out there and fighting. He just unveiled this huge uh, uh, pro-environment uh, uh, program. But Elizabeth Warren is kicking up steam, a whole lot of it, big rallies, 15, 20,000 people. I know Scott's favorite is, uh, is <laughs> his homeboy from uh, Philadelphia. Oh, here we go with this again. Joe, 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 Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, yep. How does the, Lisa, how does the presidential contest look to you from uh, Connecticut? Got a favorite yet? Well, um, we, should, we should point out the party does not endorse any candidates. Sure. <laughs> so that no one's all jumping on us with <laughs> answers. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've been preparing. Our, yeah, right. <laughs> preparing our folks, uh, you know, through our whole structure in Connecticut about uh, having to unify behind whatever Democratic candidate ends up being in the front. Obviously, we're going to back the back the candidates that um, speak more about a more socialist program like Bernie and Elizabeth and people um, who are talking about the things that we talk about in the party. But the most important thing is gonna be to defeat Trump. And so we're, we, we're gonna, um, you know, we've been talking with all our folks about that. People in our party get that. Like the, the goal is to defeat the ultra right wing. Republicans and Democrats are not the same thing. And we have to, to do that no matter what. So we'll be ready for that. And, um, but in the interim, in the meantime, we can back up our, our uh, candidates and rallies where people are talking about uh, free tuition for college and having a job that has benefits where you don't have to work three jobs to survive and having decent housing and the things that really matter to people. So, so it's the issues that we need to put 
front and center before and, and, and to build unity around the issues. And, and, and Jarvis, um, which candidate do you think is, is, or candidates do you think are, are bringing forward those issues? And do you have a sense of, of you know, there's going to be a debate coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, do, you, do you have a favorite? Um, <clears throat> well, I wouldn't say I have a favorite. What I would ha would have to say, though, I we have to recognize a historic breakthrough that the people who are in the forefront of the Democratic uh, candidates for president, on one level or another, another, support kind of socialist measures. And some are openly socialists, like Bernie. That's an enormous thing. I ran for vice president of the United States back in the 70s, and they thought socialists were crazy. You know, I mean, the media treated us like we were, like, you know, pariahs, and our ideas were crazy. We'll never get health care for all, and all these other things that we were advocating, high minimum wage, but they all have come about because the strength of the socialist and communist approach to things is that history is on our side. The people, it grows out of people's needs, not on some dogmatic, this is the formula, you gotta, it grows out of the people's needs. So free healthcare, full employment, the elimination of poverty and racism and, and uh, misogynism and, and, and homophobia and, and to save the environment, we socialists, we communists are for that completely. And to me, that's our strength. That's what keeps us going. They wonder, how'd you manage the 100 years? That's how, what keeps us going. So that to me is a great thing. And I think it's gonna be sorted out. I don't believe that we have to find the mildest Democrat <laughs> and that mildest Democrat is gonna defeat. I think history and the last election, including the midterm shows that is not the case. You better come up with some clear answers to these problems. Yeah, I just can I just add to that? Um, I was going to say that, yeah, and what Lisa was saying, where, where people are focusing on the issues and issues that, and we saw that in the midterm election, people were focusing in on candidates that were going to, people aren't looking for some sort of like Messiah or something like that that's going to deliver us from uh, Trump or you know, the ills of society in the future. Uh, and I think that's a really good thing because I think sometimes we can, uh, I, mean, I think mainstream media can like get behind personalities and things. And I think what we're seeing is a change, uh, well, in this moment where people are more focused on uh, what people are saying towards what they're going to do towards things they care about, such as, uh, you know, student debt, such as healthcare for all, such as what they're going to do about, I mean, we, I mean, this is the first time where I've heard, we, we've had some historic forums, you know, we just, uh, People's World was covering the, the Native American uh, presidential forum. That's the first in history where there's been a forum dedicated to the issues of Native, of indigenous people of this country. Just some months before that, we had the first black women um, presidential forum, which is, you know, such a huge thing because of the fact that, the, that black women have been leading a lot of these movements when it comes to some of the, a lot of the progress that we've seen going for women of color in general. So I think, you know, it's not necessarily who, uh, but I think it's going to be who, which of those people. And I know some people think like Joe Biden is like the safe guy and things like that. And I think he's playing it like that, which I don't know who that went over necessarily because there's still this idea of, I mean, I'm speaking for myself and I, I think there's still an idea that we're going to get anybody from Trump's base to somehow vote for um, against Trump. I don't think that's the case necessarily. I think it's about getting not the swing voters, but getting the, the people who didn't vote last time and the people who couldn't vote last time to the polls that's going to get us the win because we're, we are going towards a majority in this, of this, in this country of people of color uh, of, and it's already majority working people. And those are the people you need to you know, get out to vote and women particularly too. And so it goes, the the uh, the theory of that is the fact that you're going to have women of color because people of color will be the majority. Women are already the majority. So you'll have women of color who usually vote for Democrats who are going to be the majority. We need to push for those people to get out to the polls because there, we've seen in the past, they know a good majority of them not to vote for that other side. So I think 
it's going to be that kind of strategy going forward. Um, and I mean, I, I like Warren. I'll just say that towards the end, though. Um, I like her. So mm -hmm. I like, I like uh, you know, Bernie, too. Good, good. Now, you know, this is a little bit of a double-edged sword, uh, folks. You know, the Republicans are trying to paint the Democratic candidates as socialists, as communists, as Marxists. They're red baiting it like nobody's business. So um, do you think that that kind of, uh, Scott, do you think that kind of tactic is gonna be successful for them? I mean. I think less and less. Um, you know, there, there's sort of like a, an inverse proportion between um, uh, how well the tactic works and how aggressively they use it. And the reason they have to start yelling about, oh, cultural Marxism and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, uh, they're all socialists. We're going to fight socialism, this and that, is because people don't listen to that bullshit anymore. Um, that's not, you know, that that's that's a past age. Most, I, I think anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I grew up when the Soviet Union or largely when the Soviet Union still existed. Um, but young people now don't have a memory of the Cold War, don't have a memory of that intense kind of anti-communism. Anti and it's just, it's a failing strategy. There, there, are, there, are, there are other things to worry about. Michael, you've been too quiet. How are young people responding to this red baiting from Trump? Are they going for it? Is it I mean, what's your sense of things at uh, Ohio University? Well, you're way in the southern part of the state, so is it having an impact down there? Well, I remember this would have been in the primaries of 2016. Bernie took it. Bernie won the primary in Athens County, where I live in the southeastern mm. corner of Ohio. And so I don't think that young people overall, millennials, as they call them, you know, people ages 18 to 40, I think it almost is now that's the limit. I think many of them will vote for Bernie Elizabeth Warren without a, you know, hesitation. But I'm going back to a, an article in the People's World that John Bactell wrote back in March. And it was a picture, I remember it was a picture of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And the title of the article was, um, Progressive Politics Are Impossible Unless We Reject Anti-Communism. And I think that's 100% true. Because even though Bernie Sanders is the only candidate, the only Democratic presidential candidate that comes out and says, oh, I'm a Democratic Socialist, right? Um, Elizabeth Warren's being called a communist, you know, Kamala Harris is being, you know, Joe Biden, these centrist liberals, they're being called communists because they're going, you know, along with or competing with some of these more progressive policies of the more left Democrats. And so I don't think young people are going for it. Um, and I agree with Chauncey wholeheartedly that I don't think it's a question of, oh, let's get the people that voted for Trump because they were enraged or angered. But these young people that are coming out of high school and they're 18 years old now, and they've witnessed a lot of these mass shootings, you know, at their concerts, their churches, their synagogues, their high schools, et cetera, et cetera. These people who have never voted before and the people who live, you know, in uh, more rundown areas, working class neighborhoods, and they've never felt like they had a voice before, these projects of um, voter registration and, you know, fighting voter, voter suppression, I think it's really going to make an impact in the next election. So it's exciting, but we have to really fight for working class unity. That's going to be key. And I just want to add on, on top of that, um, on the, the need to reject anti-communism, um, the anti-communism, like people talk about, oh, you know, where did the alt-right come from? Where did this, you know, fascist threat come from? Where um, uh, a lot of it, slipped in through the back door of anti-communism. You know, the ruling class allied itself with or made space for these hardcore right-wing people because of a shared opposition to socialism and communism. And so just, I guess I wanted to point out that, that in our experience, anti-communism and uh, white supremacy, anti-communism and hardcore reactionary politics, anti-communism and fascism, are always are always hand in hand. They are, and I remember Joe Sims had an article. You know, I mentioned uh, John Bechtel's article from March, but just a few months later, the members of the quote unquote hashtag the squad, you know, AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and Ayanna Presley, they were called communists. They were told to get out of the country, and they're all women of color. And so there, there's the connection right there. And I was glad that our party, I mean, particularly Joe Sims, was able to call it out 
and you know p post it up on the website because history does repeat itself. I think it's good too that they oh, go ahead, John. Well, go on, Chauncey. No, I was gonna say I think it, uh, you brought up uh, Michael brought up the squad. I think it's good too that a good amount of these cannons aren't falling into that who are being called it. You know, I remember in just looking at Twitter when AOC was called that and she called it out. She was like, what is this McCarthyism that you're trying to throw at people? Like we're talking about the issue. That's way more serious than whatever you're trying to red baby with. Like not falling into the idea of no, you know, we're not this, we're not that. And I think that's, I think that's a good strategy to have because like others have said, you can't, you can't have a progressive movement and still have like, oh, but not these communist type of deal you know you can't do that as well so and i just you know i think it's also one of those things too where it's always it always baffles me when i'm online or people are talking to me like oh do you know what communists do and blah, blah, blah. and then it's kind of like but like we were just talking about the all right you know it's a whole thing like there are people who are neo-nazis getting profiles done of them in the new york times and you know there are there's there's a whole fascist you know, emergence going on across our globe, not just in the US, but we're seeing with Brexit and others that, you know, that's not normal. Like if you're gonna point out something, you know what I mean? That's like a problem, it's that, you know, not this idea of people who may identify socially or communist wanting to call for healthcare for all, you know, just, you know, um, compare who's demanding what and you'll see who's the real issue versus, you know, commie and a Nazi, so. <laughs> Thank you, Chauncey. That was a good point. I want to uh, invite our uh, audience to uh, ask some questions. You know, don't don't be afraid to uh, uh, jot down uh, some some concerns that you have. We'll be uh, happy to ask them. I want to. Yeah, so, if you're uh, if you're joined into this, um, uh, if you're uh, participating in this webinar as a as a guest, you can use the chat panel, uh, or um, if you're watching on, on Facebook, uh, you can also, um, you know, just type a question, comment in there. We um, we're sort of trying to monitor it, but and and we'll, we'll we'll hope we get to share your voice. We do have some greetings from folks um, on the the chat uh, bar here, and uh, a question from from one comrade who reminded us of the need to speak about the. The United Front to defeat Trumpism, which I think our, our our panelists have been doing a pretty great job of addressing. Speaking of the that United Front, there are um, one important contingent of that front is the young generation. And I wanted to ask uh, our panelists, Michael, perhaps you might want to weigh in on the gun issue. Um, seems to have well, obviously, because the people. A lot of the people who are being, we just had that horrible thing happen in Texas today, by the way, and our uh, sympathy and hearts go out to the families of those who were killed and wounded in, in Texas. But it's really resonating amongst high school students and college students and uh, so on. Um, is that gonna be the issue that uh, brings out the young generation this election, uh, Michael? I think definitely that's that's one of the determining factors in getting young people out to vote. It's definitely something they're very vocal about on campus ever since about this time last year when they sent out an email survey. It was an actual democratic vote uh, for faculty and students on whether or not students should be allowed to do, you know, the open carry on campus and in the classroom. And, you know, the answer was a, a no. It was, you know, it was above 90 percent no. And I remember thinking this was around the time that the Republican Party, uh, the rhetoric was, well, let's arm teachers. And I remember thinking this is nonsense. And I was glad to see that my students and my colleagues, you know, my classmates were also against this. But I don't think it's limited to um, guns. In fact, I, I remember um, someone just the other day, you know, I heard some young students uh, talking about, you know, oh, it's health care. You know, once we turn 26 years old, we're off our parents' health care. And I just can't afford that. I know I'm not going to be able to afford that. Uh, student debt, you know, people are really turned on to Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, you know, promises of forgiving student uh, student loan debt. And so I think there are a, a few factors, but the guns is definitely one of them. Joe? Go ahead, Jarvis. Yeah, I just want to say that the concept of extremist policies is most dramatically expressed by the extreme right. 
I mean, think about it. They are incarcerating children who have been kidnapped from their families. They are putting immigrants into concentration camps on the border, southern border. They are eliminating amnesty. They are eliminating union rights. They are eliminating the, the right to dissent wherever they can. They don't recognize global warming. Now these... I think we lost Jarvis. Did we lose Jarvis? Yeah, we appear to have... Uh, he was, he was making it. a good point. Hopefully he'll be uh, right back. Until he gets back, um, you know, so we, 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 we have the, the issue of uh, common sense background checks. We have the issue of student debt. Brazil is burning. You know, there's there's the the Amazon is, and uh, the you you got this huge hurricane going on now that's hitting the Bahamas. Um, what impact do you think that um, climate change is that going to motivate people to get out, or does some terrible, unthinkable catastrophe have to happen before folks? Wait. It's also a, this is a question actually somebody wrote in as well. Um, uh, John Bechtel um, uh, wrote, what's your thoughts on the climate crisis? What can be done in light of the obstruction of Trump and the GOP? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Well, I was just going to say that when we think about even with Amazon, what's happening there, like those, like what's going on is that these business people are trying to get in there. The new guy that's the president, it's like total right wing. He pretty much had a whole thing in going in Brazil of make Brazil great again. Once again, all of this is connected. This, you know, these these right wing movements um, of not thinking about when we think about capitalism, when we think about how they function. You know, there's always this idea that rich people are smart. Um, in the sense of, okay, I know that sounded really extreme, but like in the sense that there's like some long, like they're just like way smarter than working people. And they always have, the, that's why they own the factories. That's why they own the means of production. But when we think about what, per, what pushes forth capitalism, at the heart of that is the greed, right? And it's the greed in the immediate sense. And that's what we're seeing when it comes to the fact that we have an administration right now that still is very much in denial about climate change. He's very much in denial about the about the the disasters that we're having. You know, as you know, these hurricanes are coming towards Puerto Rico and other places. You know, they were you know taking money from the FDA, you know, to to fund the wall and things. It's it's not being seen, and and it's not just this idea of you know, this is just a natural progression of the globe and the world, a lot of this stuff can be, could have been avoided, can be avoided. And we're on a ticking time clock to it. And it's not just, you know, oh, it's just happening. It's very much what they're doing is, is very much a, a, a thing that we can't control. We can control how we go about this. And that, that's where it comes with. It comes to the 2020 elections when it comes to being involved in all of this, because it's not just natural disasters. And also in connecting the idea of climate change is I think the way you're going to get people, sometimes you can't just talk about, oh, the polar ice caps are, are melting. Yes, you know, for people who are, you know, versed in that or pay attention, that might be a big thing. I think you also have to connect the idea of environmental racism that happens, the ideas of issues that affect people, that it's not just, you know, um, of course it's the hurricane, of course it's the fires, but it's also the idea that when these things happen, certain neighborhoods don't get helped. You know, uh, certain places don't have resources when it comes to certain um, areas being polluted or certain places not having in infrastructure. All of this is the environment. What we're seeing now, like in my home city, North New Jersey, you know, what's going on there when it comes to the, the slow movement of the, of the city administration there to, to deal with the water crisis of the toxic neural, the neural toxins of lead in that water. The same thing that we're still dealing with Flint and has been going on because because of the corruption of, 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 of what was going on there and them not putting up the, the idea. And in these two cities and cities across the country, a lot of times what you see, these are black and brown neighborhoods. This is environmental racism. These are things of the environment. And I think you have to connect that to people so they see why this is an issue that go, that's not just sometimes what they hear about, oh, polar ice caps and things, but this is very much in your city. This is in your town. Your water is being affected by these decisions these people are making. And I think that's the way you connect to get other people on that, um, on that train. 
Thank you, Chauncey. Scott, do we I'm have back. a question from our Yeah, we got so our the 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 chat box here has just been has just been jumping off. Um uh one that, that I wanted to highlight was um somebody asked like uh please talk about the role for people of faith in communities. Uh, and I want to uh, broaden that a little bit to um you know what is you know communists have the the reputation of you know being we're all staunch atheists who hate religion and this and that and we you know, opiate of the masses and whatever, which is a complete misunderstanding of what Marx was saying. Right. Um, but does anyone um, want to comment on that? Has anybody had experience working with um, faith groups in, in some sort of community struggle or uh, want to talk about uh, the role for, uh, the, the role that uh, religious groups have, have played on the left in, in American history? Absolutely. Can I speak, Joe? Go ahead. I'm sorry, I got cut off here for a minute. Um, and, um, you know, we have devout Christians and Muslims of Jewish uh, people who embrace the Communist Party or in the Communist Party. We have never practiced uh, uh, a hateful attitude towards uh, people who believe in uh, religion and hereafter and so on. Gus used to say we, Gus Hall, the former chair, we're not at war with religion, we're at war with communism, with a capitalism rather. And I, I think that was a, a very important um, way, way to put it. And therefore, you know, Arnold Johnson was the top leader of the party for many, many years. He was actually Gus's sort of uh, right-hand assistant for many, many years when I came around. He was a Presbyterian minister. There were so many others who were like that. And of course, Martin Luther King um, was devout in his religious belief, but revolutionary in his politics. I want us to understand, like Barbara today, the fight for a more humane and democratic and decent society for all, for a working class society, if you put it that way, anti-racist society, most people who have a serious attitude towards religion support that. It is the, the odd people are those who come the other way and are embracing fascist ideology and giving it a religious cover. We got to recognize that. The, uh, if I might uh, switch the subject a, a little bit, we talked about the gun issue, we talked about the environment issue, voter suppression. Uh, what about the military budget? Um, is that doesn't seem to have generated much debate so far in the democratic uh, 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 contest, you know? Uh, is it possible to advance without addressing the issue? They just reinitiated the medium range cruise missiles, you know, they got out of the treaty with Russia. And uh, so, how are we going to bring that issue to the forward, or is it an issue in your opinion? Uh, anybody? I think it's definitely an issue. I was going to say, um, I think it's an issue just because Ben Shapiro the other day, who's a right wing, you know, radio podcast show host and a Zionist, you know, right wing uh, Jewish guy here in the United States and a Trump supporter, he claims, you know, that it would be wonderful if we could live in a world. Uh, Bernie Sanders fantasy world if we had all this money or a world where all this money existed and I'd say it goes back to the military budget and I'm kind of surprised they haven't especially Bernie and, and Warren why they haven't brought it up um, since a lot of their programs you know health care uh, student debt forgiveness etc cetera, etc cetera, are only going to be possible if we cut the military spending so that's all I have to say about that. And those programs in fact are already in place for the military, that's the that's the hilarious thing for me about a lot of this the right wing rhetoric. Um, like, oh, you know, we can't have socialism because people are greedy. We can't have you know uh, free health care. We can't have the people are too lazy for you know student debt relief. Um, but look what the military represents. I think for a lot of working class people, um, uh, something based on an idea of service where you get you know, free healthcare and subsidized housing and 
you know, um, subsidized education. And so there's a sense, I think, in which the, well, not a limb in saying this, but the, the, the military, the way it's set up in this country represents in a certain sense, the, like a working class vision of socialism, but taken, uh, twisted, deformed and turned into something else by being pressed into service for the capitalist class. Right. There's um, so, you know, when I look at working class people joining the military, I don't see people signing up to, you know, go kill people. I see people signing up to serve and get an education. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we're about to wrap up, folks. It's uh, 854. We promised our panelists we'd only have them on for an hour on this day before uh, Labor Day. Uh, but before we go, um, I want you to uh, imagine in your, in your mind's eye that you got a big communist cake in front of you. And it's got a hundred candles on it. Now, ain't no way you're gonna be able to blow out a hundred candles. But once you get them out, you got three wishes. Three wishes. Um, uh, what would you wish for? Uh, parting shots before we end uh, today. Um, three wishes. Anything can happen. You can go as far out as you want, big as you want, or small as you want. Um, uh, Chauncey? Uh, would you I just like had the feeling that you were going to call me first, and I wanted to think that through. <laughs> But um, I guess the first one would be, you know, I mean, I don't want to say like topo capitalism or something, but you know, yeah, <laughs> like that, like the, I guess my wish would be the idea of uh, a just society, uh, one where people aren't exploited and things. And that, of course, I think is, you know, and it's going to be unique to any country, but I think, you know, socialism and then communism for, for us here. Um, and the other one of... I guess in the immediate sense is um, more uh, black and brown women leadership in a lot of uh, these uh, organizations that are fighting or recognizing the black and brown women leadership uh, because you know we have a tendency uh, where that's not always recognized. So just maybe a, a wish to to make more room for that. Um, and the third one is more wishes. Fine, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> More, more wishes. Great. Um, uh, Michael. I think immediately, you know, the reforms that we absolutely need under capitalism in order, you know, to lay the foundations for socialism, you know, Medicare for all, uh, Green New Deal, you know, and able to survive for there to even be socialism, right? We have to save the planet first. Um, and then long term, you know, getting people organized, you know, people are still afraid to be associated with unions. Um, or defending, you know, progressive candidates and their policies, you know. And I remember seeing the old documentary, um, Seeing Red from 1983. And a woman was saying, you know, I used to tell my colleagues, don't be afraid of the word communist because of you talking to me, people are gonna call you a communist. And so hopefully class consciousness, you know, in the long term, um, people getting organized, right? And then, yeah, going from there. Great. Thank you. Lisa? Number one, close the camps immediately. Close all these detention, horrible detention camps. Reunite all the families. Um, pass the citizenship for all. I made a lot of wishes already. I'm going to say one of uh, jobs for youth, jobs for all, that everybody should have the right to a decent job to be able to provide for themselves and their family and have a hopeful future. And then everyone else said my other wishes already. Thank you. Good ones. Jarvis. Well, I, I agree with all the wishes. I share them. And the one big one before us, well, first of all, don't forget from the 14th of September to the 21st, there will be celebrations all across the country uh, welcoming the centennial of the Communist Party USA. The other thing is, I think we ought to be clear. Defeating Trump in the election, the Republican election is a historic challenge we face today. Let's do it. Great. We got two more. 
Think about it. Uh, Scott. Um, wishes. I just got one. I just got one wish. Uh, I think um, that includes a lot of others, but um, I kind of want the, maybe this is petty, but I want to turn the tables. Um, I want, you know, everybody who's suffering from the, uh, the various um, forms of, of insecurity and violence sown by capitalism, the people who are being displaced by um, the climate crisis, the people who are uh, living in poverty, the people who lack medical care, the vast majority of people who don't have any kind of security in their life. Um, I want those people um, in charge, those people to have what they need, and um, the people that have been hoarding uh, the capitalist class who's, you know, who drives us to crisis again and again. Um, I want them to, you know, I want them to feel the sting for once. Um, so that's, that's my wish. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Those are all great wishes. And if we fight hard and if we fight together in unity with uh, everybody, including people we don't agree with, uh, but we can agree on one thing, that Trump is a clear and present danger to humanity, we can move that Johnson forward. And that's what we're trying to uh, do. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Chauncey. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Jarvis. Thank you, um, uh, Michael. Scott and I kind of have to do it, but <laughs> he's a, he's a full-time uh, volunteer. Um, but really, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. It's been a great uh, panel. We'll see everybody on the 14th in Chicago and in New York and in LA. Uh, and we just got a, uh, there was another. Baltimore, they're having an event in Baltimore. Uh, the comrades down there will be very angry with me if I don't announce that. Mm -hmm. And also in my home state of Cleveland, we'll, uh, uh, Rosanna and I will be participating in, a, an, in an event there. So without further uh, ado, uh, good night, good evening, revolution. Let's fight to defeat Trump. My wish is for light for the path and an end to homelessness and food for the hungry. Those are my, my three. Take care and good night. night. Happy birthday, CPUSA. Good night, Happy everyone. Birthday. Bye, night. Yay, CPUSA. Boom. <laughs> All right, guys. See Thank you. Bye-bye.